uh, end of this one day. It's been a joy. I was had some great conversations and and uh, met some of the new guys. McCann, obviously the catcher, and reconnected with uh, Jake and and all these guys as well, uh, Michael. So it's been an honor. Um, you know, I'm so glad that uh, things worked. Out. Uh, even though it's a little later than usual this year, but it, uh, I'm so excited uh, for the season and just want to wish the uh, the team and the fans uh, the best. Uh, obviously, I, they have my 100% support and I um, think we're going to have a, a very good season. Thank you, Mike. Uh, let's go to our first question. It comes from Mike Puma. Your line is open. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Um, hey, man. I wonder- I'm, I'm, I'm well. Uh, wondering what you thought about uh, the sale with uh, Steve Cohn and kind of what your interactions have been uh, with him to this point. Yeah, obviously with uh, logistical being in Italy and and with all the um, uh, new duties of taking off on the team. Um, and first off, I had a great conversation with Sandy um, after the sale was finalized. Um, and I look forward to meeting Steve in person very soon. I haven't yet, obviously, just logistically, it's been difficult. I just got back from Europe last week. Uh, but, um, and, you know, honestly, I'm an old school guy. I mean, I don't like texting and doing a lot of email stuff. So, and, and just through talking with Sandy, we're looking forward to meeting face to face, hopefully very soon, but ultimately, um, just it seems like that he has such a passion for the team and uh, uh, you don't get that successful without taking risks and stepping into new ventures and knowing how a management system works. So there's always going to be unforeseen circumstances where um, you have to make adjustments. That's part of business in any business. That's part of uh, obviously part of sports. But I think the fans should rest well, knowing that the team is in good hands and um, uh, and and the future looks bright. And ultimately, uh, you don't get successful in one field and 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 not transfer that to to other ventures. So I'm excited and I look forward to meeting him. And obviously, we have a lot in common as far as his love with history uh, and the heritage of the team. So. Um, I think we're going to have a lot of common ground. And also, with this year being the the twentieth anniversary nine eleven, the Yankees Mets playing that day, can we? You think we can pretty much assume we're we're going to see you at City Field uh, for that uh, special game this year? <laughs> yeah, I mean, of course, uh, we 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 want the um, without giving away too many sort of. Uh, preview it i'm sure it's going to be an emotional night um i think it's going to be something um done with taste and reverence but also celebrate the lives as well and the bravery that was 9-11 so don't want to give away too many uh too many uh um, spoilers i guess but i'm sure it's going to be an emotional night and um we haven't finalized all the, the, the plans yet, but yes, I, I look forward to, to being there and, and um, reconnecting with a lot of, of, of characters and individuals that, that, um, that obviously went through that week. So uh, it's tough. It's going to be very difficult, of course, uh, recounting all those memories, but uh, ultimately that's, that's I'm sure what they would want is the celebration of, of life instead of the, uh, instead of the sadness. Next question comes from Tim Healy. Hey, Mike. Uh, the Mets have a new catcher this year in James McCann. I was curious, what is the hardest part of changing teams and learning a new staff as a catcher? Well, we had, we had a really nice conversation. First off, he's a lot bigger than I thought he, uh, he was. So <laughs> from a size and intimidating uh, stature, he's going to be fine. We, we just had a nice conversation. I, ultimately, I think uh, catching is, is um, about relationships. It's about uh, having the team and the, the staff have confidence in you. Uh, and he has, a, he has a really nice demeanor about him. He seems very confident, obviously, the experience. Um, and, uh, but, of course, any new uh, situation coming to New York City, the, the, the situation is going to be a little different. 
Um, and you're going to have to make adjustments quickly. I think it's a very, when I came here, I was traded here in the middle of the season. So I didn't have a spring training, so to speak, to get, to get used to the staff and get to know uh, the guys. That was good and bad. It was, it was good in the sense that you just have that trial under fire and you just have to go in there and get it done. But bad, of course, because you don't get to know all the idiosyncrasies and, and philosophies and, and sort of how to almost be a sort of a, a psychiatrist, so to speak, which guys you had to pat on the back and which guys you had to give encouragement to. So at least he has that time to do that. So I'm, I'm not worried about him. I think he's going to be great and I think he's going to do a great job. And uh, so, uh, and I told him, I said, look, anything you ever need, I'm, I'm not always in, in the face and, and, but I, um, I look forward. Our conversation was great. And I told him anything you need anytime, just reach out. I'm here for you. That's, that's why I'm here. And I think it was when you were in camp last year that your kids in Italy were, were at a school and nobody really knew what was about to happen. What has the last year been like for you, especially this time last year when Italy was in the middle of it all? Well, it's interesting. They had just, um, recently locked down the country again. Um, they have three classifications, um, Verde, which is green, uh, Jalo, which is yellow, and then orange and red. And I think the country went recently to red, Rosso. And uh, so for the last uh, week, they've been on Zoom lessons. My wife has been very stressed. <laughs> so I'm kind of just staying away. I hope everything's going well over there. But uh, the philosophy is now they'll have two weeks up until uh, Easter break and then two weeks off for Easter. So hopefully by the mid April, they'll be back in school. But up until that point, they had been going to school since last August. So from that side, it was a benefit. Um, obviously Italy's been hit hard and, and uh, they're still not out of the woods. They've been having issues with the vaccine rollout. The distribution hasn't been very efficient. So I hope that improves for the country and I hope Italy generally and gets better because I mean, the country thrives on tourism and that's what is one of the main factors for economic. Uh, um, that's one of the main economic uh, industries, so to speak. So I hope it does get better. Um, unfortunately, it's a country that's uh, very rural in some areas and provincial. So they don't have the efficiency to get to the areas and get, get the vaccine out. So I hope it does get better. It hasn't been a fun year, uh, as you all well know, even here. So we've been struggling to try to find some normalcy, but I hope things get better. It seems like they are, knock on wood, and, and uh, hope and pray it continues. Thank you, Mike. Uh, next up is Tony DeComo. Hey, Mike, good to see you. Um, hey, Tony. I know you've you've talked with DeGrom uh, in years past, and I know you have built a little bit of a relationship with him. I'm curious, as a Hall of Famer, this is a guy whose career started so late, and obviously he's put up Hall of Fame seasons. Where do you see him in terms of that conversation of a guy who could one day make it to Cooperstown? Well, I think um, you would you have to take him seriously uh, right now. I mean, I think... One of the things, and again, I've always avoided, I've never been a huge minutia numbers guy and getting into the arguments because I think ultimately that's for guys like you and guys that really study the game and put history and put perspectives in history. So um, I always kind of go with sort of the character or at least the um, perception of dominance. And, and I don't know how you could not take him seriously in that regard because He's doing some incredible things in market number one uh, and just doesn't seem like he's slowing down. He's knock on wood. You know, he's been been healthy. Uh, but again, I think when the dust settles on his career and you're able to put it in a historical perspective, that's kind of when it will be the real sort of test. But um you know, I'm partial because I like him. I think he's a great guy, and I think he's a su super personality and knows just just goes about his business in such such a great way um, uh, that you know you you do have to kind of take that into account for me. But you know, again, I I think uh, he just has to keep doing what he's doing. He just I said, don't change anything. Just keep just keep if it's not broken, don't fix it. Don't go out there and feel like you have to 
do so much more every single year to reprove. I think he's able to really keep it in perspective and, and knows what he can do and what he can't do and knows that, that to get himself healthy over the course of the season, uh, he's has to do certain things. And he's, he's been so great at that. So um, I'm proud of him. I think, and he's a great guy. So I think he does everything well. And I think hopefully when the dust does settle, he, he could be there. Never give a hundred percent though. <laughs> Some somewhat relatedly, um, you know, I know under the old ownership, the Mets in particular had talked about becoming maybe more aggressive in retiring numbers, celebrating past players. I'm just wondering where you, as as one of the few people who does have your number retired there, um, how, how you feel about that sort of thing? I'm, I'm happy about that. Uh, look, I don't think it was necessarily by design that you would set up this system that was, was um, not as, uh, I guess, lack of aggressive to... to retiring numbers and things. I, I just think it was a question of, uh, it's a question of timing because I think by nature, the Mets have always been a traditional um, organization and guys that have been alumni here have kind of hung out and have always been sort of in the fabric of the club. And then modern times, guys obviously move around more and and they're not as, um, I guess, uh, what's the word I'm like, they just are onto different things. I mean, the world changes. And I think uh, now that we're seeing and we're looking back, I mean, without giving, I don't want to give any surprise away because I know some things I don't want to, I don't want to spoil it, but I think this year we're going to have some, some nice additions to the hall of fame. You may or may not know, I don't want to give spoilers. So um, one of my greatest joys is to work with the fans and work with the alumni and, in my experience in New York was just something that um, was, was one of the best time of my life. And I just love the fans and the way they've taken me into their family. And so I'm going to be a little bit more aggressive and going to bat for guys. And that's something I really look forward to talking to Steve about as well. And, and I think we're going to form a really nice uh, um, do it in a way that's tasteful and the timing is good, but I think it's exciting because again, uh, for me, you know, unfortunately, as time is going on, we're starting to lose some of the, the treasures of the game. So I think it's important that we do that while we still have them, you know. Thank you. Yeah, man. Uh, Ken Davidoff, you are next. Your line's open. Hey, Mike. Good to see you. How are you, Ken? I'm all right. Thank you. Good, man. Um, just uh, want to ask you about uh, Francisco Lindor. There's some parallels between uh, your arrival with the Mets and his. I know you were mid-season, uh, but you know an elite player uh, in his prime, approaching free agency. And uh, I was just wondering, uh, looking back now, uh, how tough a call was that uh, to? You know, I know it was after the season ended, but before he, the open market, you know, to. To, to bypass free agency and, and how you're feeling about the decision uh, 22 plus years later? Well, uh, I was fortunate to, to have a nice conversation with him today. And uh, he, again, seems like he has such a, such a good head on his shoulders, obviously a great player. <clears throat> My only advice to him is just, just go out and play. Uh, let, you know, we used to say as a, as a, and when I played, you know, you know, players play, Coaches coach, managers manage, writers write. Every you just do your job, and uh, you know, try not to get too wrapped up. And and I think all of us are human, so we kind of always want to know where we're going to be. We always kind of kind of want to have control of our destiny, and so and that's part of what you guys do is figuring out where where um, if and when there's a great time, and and if he is going to be here long term. I just think there's a spiritual component to it. I think he's got to go out and get comfortable. And the fact that he has such a good team around him is important as well. For me, there was also the, the, the human element, there was teammates and, and we were at a time with the team that we knew they were, we were trying to win. So we were going to put some pieces in place to try to make that happen. And so uh, that, that's my only advice for him. Just go out and play. Go out and play, put your numbers up, and if it's meant to be, it's he's going to be here. But I think sometimes uh, to kind of force that or to to have it be where it's not coming from an organic place, it's just kind of forced. And 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 the team, obviously, momentum with the team. It's always good that the team is playing well. Thing when the energy's good and the team is good and the atmosphere is good, things have 
of way of falling into place. Thanks, Mike. Good seeing you. Yeah, man. Mike, your next question will come from Marley Rivera. Um, hi, Mike. This is Marley from ESPN. Thank you for the time. Um, you pleasure. obviously, you obviously had a Hall of Fame career with the Mets. What does it take to handle the New York stage? And from what you have seen from Lindor, uh, do you believe he's equipped to handle it? So far, I do. I think um, there's a lot, as I mentioned in the previous question, there are some factors as far as teammates, management. Um, you have to have a good support system. You have to have uh, people around you that um, know their role. And, you know, I had great teammates here. I mean, I had you know, John Olerud when I first got here and, and, uh, and Ray Ordonez and Edgardo Afonso and, and uh, Al Leiter and Dennis Cook. And, he, and we had fun, you know. I mean, you, you got to have fun. You got to enjoy the people you work with. Uh, I think that translates to success on the field. And you have to learn how to deal with failure as well as handle success. So I think when he invariably we all struggle, it's a game of, of failure at times. And so he's going to have to know how to get out of those situations where maybe he's not playing as well. And once you kind of deal with it here, because of course there's going to be scrutiny and, and media and things like that. And, and just to, Generally, try to stay off the roller coaster, try to keep things even keel and be consistent. And if you're not doing one thing well at, the, uh, at, at, at a time, you have to do the other thing. So obviously, he's a, he's a defensive guy as well. He just catch the ball. To me, is catch the ball, hustle. Um, and when you do those things, your luck gets better too. So, you know, I, I just believe in if you're positive, positive things happen to positive people. So, um, it's going to be tough though. I mean, look, I, I think that's part of the, the challenge of being here and, uh, it's, it's, that's what makes it unique. I mean, it's a wonderful place to play when you're winning, but if you're struggling, it's, it's not, it's not a lot of fun. So but I think he's <laughs> just, got, I, I think he's got it. I think he does. I mean, it's, he has to go out and prove it of course, but, uh, I mean, he just seems like a really cool guy. He's got, you know, colored hair. That's for sure. I like it. <laughs> And in a slightly uh, unrelated subject, except that you mentioned a uh, failure, uh, you finished your career with a batting average of 308. So how important is it for a player that number 300? And I'm specifically asking because I'm writing about Dustin Pedroia finishing at 299. Oh, <laughs> she got one more hit. Uh, I think, on, and I don't want to probably get into a deep minutia conversation about batting average and how the batting average perception has shifted in the last decade because of all the um, numbers and analysis and things like that. Uh, for me as a hitter, that was like one of our priorities. I mean, we, I mean, I learned from, from hitting coaches and average was the main barometer if you could hit or not. So um, I know now, total numbers and war and OPS and all these things have, have crept into the conversation when evaluating hitters talent. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, I think for me, I tell people all the time, the difference between hitting 250 and 300 and a hundred at bats is five hits. So if you think about it, those situations where you're striking out because they've kind of decriminalized the strikeout you can make contact, you know, five more times and maybe you get three hits or two hits. It's like, I love making contact. I mean, I don't know how much I struck out one year. I think maybe the most I ever struck out was maybe in the seventies, sixties, but then of course I would have my walks as well. Um, I just like making contact. I mean, I, I, even if I was not a great runner per se, if I got on with a uh, first base and two outs, it gives a chance like the guy hitting behind me to hit a home run maybe, or, or a double, or maybe there's a walk in a double. So I, I, I don't understand. I don't think there's a cognizant de-emphasis of the importance of batting average, but it seems like for me, there is a little bit. And I hope at least maybe we can reconnect because there was some recent footage I saw of Tony Gwynn. And uh, I tell people all the time in three years, I hit, 336, 346, and 360, and I finished in the batting title race th third all three years. 
<laughs> so, you know, maybe I don't have that silver bat on my wall, but knowing that I got beat by the best is a little bit of a consolation prize. Yeah, man. Yes, ma'am. Next up uh, is a question from Justin Toscano. Hey, Mike, good to see you. Uh, kind of what you're talking about with Lindor, but a lot of the players as a whole have been talking about just the great offseason they had, but how now their expectations to kind of live up to, to the team that was built here. Throughout what you saw in your career, what's the most important part of handling those expectations and actually going out on a nightly basis and, and winning to prove that? I think just doing your part uh, and worrying about the things that are under your control. Uh, I think we, as I've said, we just try to get maybe too wrapped up sometimes in the things that we, the, the thing that we can control is number one, our health, number one, our attitude, uh, number three, our, our ability to just go out and work hard every night. Um, life sometimes has a way of getting very complicated. We start to complicate things, think too much, just go through so many scenarios and, and not just go out that day be hundred percent healthy that day, go out that day and hit four balls hard and catch the balls you're supposed to catch. I mean, that to me uh, has always been advantageous, just, just to do your job, basically do your job and um, do the things that you have control over and everything else. If you get wrapped up into that, it starts taking away with what you're supposed to do on the field. So that was always my sort of formula of dealing with expectations here. Cool. Thank you. Next question comes from Bradford Davis. Hi, Mike. Nice to meet you. Um, Pleasure. During your uh, playing career, you know, your defense often wasn't highly regarded among fans and you know media because uh, you didn't throw many runners out. But renewed public understanding and attempts, I guess, to quantify on-field value of uh, framing has ranked you as one of the best defensive catchers ever, at least as far, as far as, you know, the data and stats go, right? Um what do you, uh, you know, what do you think fans and, you know, an outside analyst, you know, should explore further, maybe even misunderstand today, I guess, about like, I guess, the nature of, you know, your job or your, your job as a catcher? Well, first off, um, I had a cannon. You just didn't recognize it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, look, catching – to me is so much more than just throwing. Uh, I think throwing is important and I've never shied away from that. I think as a catcher, because I was a offensive catcher and I was meant to be uh, in the corner, like a keystone in the lineup that I played probably a lot more and I played with injuries and things. And it did have a little bit of a, of a wear down effect for me physically. But as you mentioned, um, I think it was six times, don't quote me because it's been a long time, I'm older, but I think six times or seven times my staff, the staff I caught for predominantly led the league in team ERA. So as much as maybe I wasn't as good as pure throwing guys out, I felt like I cut down runs in different ways. Um, knowledge of hitting, as you mentioned, framing, I don't know if it's called that anymore. I mean, I, uh, I, had pretty good soft hands. So I was able to catch the balls and, and not sort of take a lot of balls out of the strike zone. Um, uh, Pop-ups, uh, plays at the plate, um, blocking, all these things are, are what encompasses what we consider a good catcher. Uh, and the fact is I was an offensive catcher. So as much as catching is, is a defensive position, it does help that um, – and I tell the story all the time. I mean, I was catching Tom Candiotti, who was a knuckleballer with the, with the Dodgers. I actually meant this, mentioned this in my speech. And he said, I don't care if you throw anybody out. He goes, go hit me a three-run home run. So, <laughs> so ultimately, you know, that, that was part of what obviously I did as well. So, but yes, I mean, I took those things seriously. I did love catching a good game. And as a catcher, for me, sometimes I actually got more satisfaction out of catching a two-hit shutout than actually getting two hits or a home run that night and losing. So um, the interaction and the fraternity with the pitcher and, and having a, a relationship and having him confidence in you is, is important. So yes, I mean, the, I appreciate you mentioning that and that's something I always took a lot of pride in, but 
probably it just is not going to get a lot of, of headlines, but that's fine too. That's fine. Well, yeah. You might be surprised today. Um, mm. uh, you know, um, on that note, I guess um, you mentioned earlier with uh, uh, about, about like the importance of relationships and catching. And he, I guess he, that was even included in your uh, response to me just now, but um, what, what do you, what do you find, I guess, to be important for catchers to, you know, uh, I guess, skills or traits to develop good relationships with their staff? Communication. I mean, all the things that are sort of prevalent in any good relationship, friendship, marriage, whatever, it's about communication. It's about talking. It's about um, uh, knowing how to sort of inspire and motivate someone. Some guys are more passive and some guys you need to be more aggressive with. Um, I, I just would sort of make a gamble at times. I mean, I, I would go to the aggressive route and, and I can't use language now, but I mean, just be a little bit more aggressive. And then some guys that would be more sort of like consoling and like, come on, man, you know, you're better than that. You can do it. And you have to be almost like a, a psychiatrist in a way, psychologist, you have to read different and, and guys respond differently to different things. And, and so, um, the biggest thing for me is I wanted that guy to have confidence in me. I wanted that guy to have confidence that I had his back, that I wanted him to win. And I got more joy out of him being successful than, as I said, maybe myself getting the big hit, even though I was expected to get the big hit. I wanted the guys uh, and the pitchers to feel confident in me and the relationships I had. And I mean, I caught in like 12 all-star games. So, I mean, I caught the Maddoxes and the Glavins and the Smoltz and, you know, all the good pictures of, of those eras that, uh, that sort of, you know, that really made an impact in my life. So I, it was something I look back on with a lot of joy. Great. Next up is Tim Britton. Your line's open. Hey, Mike, when you think back to that 98 season, when you came over, over to the Mets, was there a point during that year in New York where you thought to yourself, do you mind repeating the question you got a little gargled at the end there i'm sorry tim i think we're having a connection problem there uh let me uh, i'll make sure to come back to you let me let me come back to you there in a minute uh next up let's go to bruce beck Mike, hope you're well. Uh, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Mike, this ball club has a lot of new faces. Um, what's your overall message to them in terms of what it means to represent this franchise uh, and, and the pride that you took in, in playing in New York? My message is just to, to um, play for each other. I mean, uh, have each other's backs. Um, pick each other up. Um, you you have to have a unified front. I mean, you have to have one heartbeat on a team. Uh, we all have individual agendas, I should say, like plans, you know, uh, responsibilities. But to really have success and throughout history and guys that I've talked to, Hall of Famers, I mean, you can achieve a lot personally in this game, uh, but I think the, the, the biggest, the most rewarding um, achievements are, are when you achieve something as a team. Uh, the most fun I've had interacting with guys. And I mean, I told this story I, I recently uh, with, with Pat Mahomes' kid. I mean, I remember him as when he was coming around the clubhouse and now he, and he was winning the Super Bowl last year. And, and, uh, I mean, Pat was a great team, man. We had a lot of fun. And, and so when I saw him and I saw his, his son being successful, I was so happy for him because I remember the times that we had and, and the year he pitched great for us, um, you know, the years he was here. So um, and, and that's what it's all about. You know, to me, once once you realize that a team success is is you will achieve all your individual goals if the team wins it. And I've seen that before, and I, tr I truly believe it. So, I mean, and then you get a reputation. If you're on a winning team, 
other teams desire you because you know how to win, you know what it takes to win and, and winning's hard. I'll be honest with you. I mean, it is hard. It's not easy as you know. So, um, once you find that special secret sauce, I guess, and that synergy on a team, it's, it's something you'd never, you never forget. And as a retired player, being retired now over a decade, it's something you, that's the one thing you miss. When, when Michael Joseph Piazza chose the hall of fame cap that he was going to wear, um, was that a hard decision? I never really asked you about that or, or was it really a no brainer? Well, I've stated many times that I, I really felt a connection here only because in a very, I mean, you could look at a player and, and, and say, oh, it's hard to kind of understand what someone's going through. We, maybe as a player, you would go, oh, these guys make a lot of money. You, you know, you have no problems. I mean, everyone has problems and we, Lord knows last year has been a tough year, but I mean, that time in my life was a very difficult time. I mean, I, I, went through a lot of changes and, and I came to New York and didn't get off to a great start. So having come here and go through the gauntlet, so to speak, and then have very, what would be very difficult um, situation and have these fans open me up and take me into their family and, and going through all the ups and downs and, and, and uh, all the, the, the time that we experienced here, or at least I did, it was a natural for me. I mean, as I've said, I've always enjoyed coming up with the Dodgers. It was a great organization when I was there. Um, you know, they were in Vero Beach, and and that's where I learned. But uh, you know, sometimes uh, you know, breaking up is hard. <laughs> and uh, and uh, you always, again, as much as uh, it was difficult at the time, it, it was um, it was tough for me. But but I stayed positive and stuck it out here. So. No, not, it wasn't really that difficult. It really wasn't. Thank you, Mike. Be safe. My play. You too. Thank you, Mike. Next up, uh, we'll go to uh, Ed Coleman. Your line is open. Hey, Mike. Good to see you. You too. How's that cannon doing, by the way? Us. <laughs> go, go, I tell people all the time, I can't throw. I go, there's a few. I threw a few guys out from my knees. I know my younger did. days. But. I, I saw that. I saw that. <laughs> uh, and I want to go back to Jake for a second because we've seen a lot of heralded pitchers come into the game and go on to a Hall of Fame career. But, you know, he started as a shortstop, a turn pitcher, obviously, you know, as, as blossomed into a, you know, a great pitcher. You were in. Uh, a low draft pick and unheralded. You went on to a Hall of Fame career. Have you guys found a common bond with that, or have you broached that subject when when you guys have talked? Yeah. First off, your dog sounds hungry there. Yeah, so I know. <laughs> I know. I got him. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, he's. Um, I, I admire him so much. I mean, I think he's got such a great disposition, um, quiet confidence, but not hubris. Um, works hard. Uh, and, and that's the thing for me. I mean, the fact that there's the guys that have some success and they kind of just sort of sit on that and don't really try to get better or maybe even consciously. We're, we're all human. So sometimes just naturally after you get to a plateau or an achievement, you naturally decompress and go, wow, you know, I've made it to this point. Um, I'm making good money or whatever the case may be. And you become a little comfortable and you lose that hunger to want to continue to improve. And then I think a trait for these great players is that you're always like a shark. You're just searching for food. You're always searching for new challenges, new experiences. Um, and, and that's what I see about him. I mean, he just always wants to get better. I mean, he, and he, and you can tell those guys throughout history. I mean, as a hitter, I say like, okay, I'm going against Greg Max and I, you know, it's going to be tough. You know that these guys are going to grind. They're going to wear you down. They're super competitive. They're always trying to get better. They're not going to let up. There's never an easy at bat. And uh, so that respect, that mutual respect kind of comes through. Um, and it's all, and also too, it's like you can have a perception of someone or the way you think they are or their persona or their, but then when you get to know them on a personal level, it's it's um, it's also rewarding because we all have to kind of step off the stage and just be ourselves. So I enjoy those conversations with him as well. Next up, let's go to uh, Tina Servacio. Your line is open. 
Thank you. Hi, Mike. It's Tina from uh, Fox 5 in New York. Hi, Mike, Tina. go back to 9-11. Uh, you were part of one of the most emotional moments in sports, and it became such a part of the healing process, especially for New Yorkers after that tragedy. When you're out there on the field with the guys in camp right now, and, and they played during the pandemic, obviously, last year, but this year they're playing in front of their fans. Um, you know, the New Yorkers are going to be back in the seats. How aware are you when, when you're an athlete and you're playing and you're trying to win a championship that you are such an emotional part of, of a tragedy and the healing process? And, you know, how aware are these players now? Do you give them advice about that? Or does it just kind of come naturally? What, what is that whole sort of emotional process like while you're still trying to do your job as a baseball player? You made a great point in the sense that, I mean, we play for the fans, really. I mean, this is a fans game. And um, to sort of be having to go through these necessary protocols to keep people safe has is, is been difficult because um, um, as a player, at least, it's kind of like, you know, being a music star or something. It's like you make the album and you, you make the music, but then you want to play in front of people. I mean, that's, that's where you get the energy. So it is difficult. This year was difficult. I'm sure it was for these guys because it's, if you don't have that energy and that adrenaline of being in front of the fans and especially the history of baseball and the way the game is structured and the intimacy of it is it's based on fan player connection whether directly in a, in a personal experience or indirectly through a media experience. So the fact that eventually we pray and hope that the capacity will be somewhat normal this year uh, is what it's all about. Because, you know, if, if it's not, it's just, it's kind of a little sterile, you know, it's just all sterile. It's just, it's tough to manufacture your, your own adrenaline if there's not uh, fans in the stands. So I'm glad for that. And especially in New York because of the history of, of New York baseball. Um, and I think, again, this game is important. I mean, we, we, that's part of what baseball is all about is we play every day. Fans come out. Um, it's a, it's a real, it's a real special connection. So, um, and as far as that week, yeah, I mean, I think you realize that baseball does have a deeper meaning to people. Um, and one of the most rewarding things for me was, was at least seeing how much just by being a friend and showing up to hospitals and, and the firehouses and meeting the families that, that you gave them such a lift emotionally in a really tough situation um, was one of the gifts that we have. And it was nice to share that. Um, and then it puts your own life in perspective as well and makes you realize that, um, I mean, as much as we love baseball and it's very important, you realize life is important too. So um, has a way of putting things in perspective. Thanks. Next up, we'll go to Mark Roseman. Your line's open. Mike, thanks for doing this today. Uh, just to piggyback on that a little bit. So you mentioned like your mantra is always, you know, do the things you can control, be you. Uh, you talked about the players not being able to generate that adrenaline because of last year. And then you add on top of the whole new analytics and, and having to trust someone else's data. And then you throw one more layer on that. Players have to take on social causes. How do you think Mike Piazza would have done in this era as a ball player? I think – that's a good question. I think ultimately, though, um, getting uh, keeping things simple, less is more sometimes. Uh, and I think everything is generated from your ability to execute on the field. Um, I think all these other things you mentioned are important. But, you know, like for the analytics thing, I'll, I'll tackle that is like, sometimes you get like paralysis from analysis. I mean, where you have so many things and so many factors, it still comes down on your ability to execute a pitch or a swing or catch the ball in a, in a situation. So as much as we can try to complicate things, I guess there still has to be a simplistic element to it so that we don't get so caught up in 
sort of the analysis and the statistics over execution. And I think it's interesting because you have such a hyper uh, intense information metadata and all these things, but you also have to bring in the right chemistry as far as character guys and guys that are going to go play hurt and inspire other players and bring up the right sort of blend, I guess, for a team. Uh, and that's difficult because again, you, you're in an era where you're getting so much, uh, um, information and analysis and, and, and as a player, you just, for me, I've always found the simpler you can make things and keep things, the better you're going to be long-term staying off that sort of roller coaster and all the other things. Look, I mean, I think it's personal in a way. I mean, some guys are, are into that. Uh, but I don't think we should get in a situation where we're sort of expecting you just need to be you. I mean, I, I think we need to love people for the way they are, not for the way we want them to be. So I think, um, and if we were all the same, it would be a boring world too. I mean, I, I heard that for years. So why couldn't you be more this? Why couldn't you be more? Sometimes we just have to embrace the way people are. And if, you know, things are personal, I mean, maybe today with social media and with, with the way things are driven, you, you are seeing more guys that are doing things outside of the game, but they, they always kind of did that, but it just wasn't as prevalent. I mean, guys would, would do certain causes and have foundations and things. And if you could help them, great. And if, if um, you could, you know, obviously you have to prioritize your job, and if you could do those things and it didn't interfere with what you were doing, then that, that was fine. Sorry about that. Time for a couple more. Uh, Tim Britton, let's try your line again, please. Hey, Mike. Sorry, sorry about that earlier. I'm wondering, okay. back in that, that 98 season after you come over to the Mets, was there a time where you got more comfortable or, or said to yourself, you know what, this is a place I can imagine being long term? Yes, there, there was. Um, and as I said, finally, when I um, sort of surrendered, I guess, for lack of a better word, that I was meant to be here and that I had to see this through, um, then I felt like I, this is something I want to do. Uh, I think one of the biggest things for me that inspired me is I never wanted to run from responsibility and I never wanted to run from a challenge and I, I think you see a theme throughout successful people is that they're not afraid to get out of a comfort zone. They're not afraid of new challenges uh, and new expectations and new pressures. And so um, that's, that's part of life in a way. I mean, you, 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 to use a metaphor, you know, you can't steal second with your foot on first, you got to go out into the deep water and you got to go in some areas that may be challenging for you. But guess what? You know, it's, it's, you can't feel, you can't have a fear of failure. Uh, the only failure is not trying. And so for me, when you embrace that and you're able to just let it go, things sometimes have a way of working out. How long did that, that process take for you that season? It took that a while. It took a few months. I, I would say it wasn't until about the end of August where I started really saying, I, I can do this. I can, I, I, I'm meant to be here and I have to follow the, follow through on this. And then there's always a little sort of, you know, strategy and negotiations and things like that. So you never want to throw all your cards on the table. You know, you got to keep a few close to your vest. So, but things worked out, you know, I'm very blessed in my life. Um, I mean, this year, obviously, with its challenges, I, I, I think what I tell people when I speak to groups and I tell generally is I get up every day and I'm grateful. I'm grateful for my family, for my friends, for my experiences. And, you know, I hope maybe we all kind of adapt that idea. Even as much as this year has been difficult and we've lost some very special people in our lives, um, we have to go on and we have to be positive and we have to come together and, and try to, to, to build good lives, you know? And so that's for me is, is very important. So um, I'll get, get everyone off the couch here, but yeah, generally that's just kind of my philosophy for life. Mark Healy, your line's open. Go ahead. 
Hey, Mike. Um, you know, when I think about Shea Stadium closing and I think about City Field opening and I think about you and Tom Seaver, you know, closing Shea and then opening City Field, uh, when you learned about Tom's passing this year uh, and where, you know, his place in history and having those moments, uh, what did you reflect upon when you heard about Tom, you know, uh, Tom's passing? He, he was a special, special man, special player, um, special character, um, sort of a once in a generational type of player, but, but even so much more than his ability on the field was his ability to inspire uh, and um, motivate people um, he was definitely, you know, the, 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 the flame for, for the moths. I mean, he was that type of guy. He, he throughout his history, um, he was just that guy, as I was mentioning, he was never afraid of a challenge. He was never afraid to put a team on his back. Um, he had a lot of fun, you know, it, very rarely do you meet people uh, that have had an encounter with someone that overwhelmingly it's a hundred percent positive. You, you never, I mean, every, every now and then you'll hear, okay, uh, well, this is a good guy. He's a good guy. Yeah. Well, I, you know, you're never going to get a hundred percent review of, of, of a positive review, I guess. Um, you're always going to have a bad day. You're going to meet someone and you may not be the, the nicest person, or you just, you're in a bad mood or you had a fight with someone and you're just, but, but generally everyone who knew him and had time with him is always, uh, can't stop talking about the effect he had on you and the fact that he was such a renaissance guy too. He was just never afraid of new experiences. And uh, it's a huge loss. It's a huge loss for um, obviously his family, but, but our organization, the city of New York. Um, but as I've said before, I'm, I'm glad his suffering is over because uh, you know, it's, as much as we're sad that they have passed on, we, we do hate to see people suffer. Uh, and so again, I, I think, uh, we're, we're going to do everything we can to, to, um, uh, remember his legacy, keep his legacy alive. Okay. Mike, your final question will come from Jerry beach. Jerry, go ahead. Hey Mike. Good to see you. Um, I guess good to see you, my, Jerry. Good to see you, man. Um, you know, is, is there a different vibe this spring with the players and the new ownership group? And how important is this first spring training with a new ownership, given the experiences you had in L.A. in 98? Uh, uh, good question. Obviously, it's different <laughs> with with the, the protocols and, and still dealing, hopefully, with what we believe is the last um, chapter of this pandemic. We hope that this is uh, – um, going forward, the, the, the worst is behind us, and now we can look to the summer with some optimism, getting back to normal. Um, but look, I mean, we all want to make a good first impression. We all want to get off on the right foot. But this is a tough game. I mean, it's a difficult game, and you're always going to have sort of uh, challenges and, and hiccups and things like that. Um, nothing is ever going to be 100% smooth, especially in this game, when you have a lot of moving parts. Um so uh, I just tell the fans, look, I mean, I think when you have um, resources and you have incentive and you have this desire to achieve something, uh, you may not snap your fingers and happen instantaneously. It takes time. It takes to get to know people and things like that. But putting that aside right now, I think you have a very interesting team. And I think you have a team that that has some some very good talent. Um praying everyone stays healthy and uh, they get off to a good start. And, you know, anything could happen, really. I mean, winning is, as I've said, very difficult, even for teams that are expected to win. So you could have a piece of paper and saying this team has got the, the best odds to win, but they still have to go out and prove it. Great. Thank you, Mike, very much for your time this afternoon. Appreciate everybody joining. Just uh, one reminder that a separate Zoom link We'll, uh, we'll apply for uh, Mets players uh, coming out of the game today, as well as Louis' post-game interview. Thank you all again.